Welcome to the Level 1 Financial Reporting and Analysis Summary Video Series. This video is a summary of the reading on non-current liabilities. The most important long-term liability is a bond or a long-term loan and we need to understand what we report on the balance sheet when we issue a long-term instrument such as a bond. The bond issue price depends on the par value which is the face value, the coupon rate and the effective interest rate when the bond is issued. So if you have a situation where the face value which is synonymous with par value is 100, the issue date is 2011, maturity date is 2013. So how many years do we have? We have 2011, 2012 and 2013 so 3 years and the coupon rate is 10% annually. If the effective interest rate, this is the rate that investors demand when the bond is issued. So if that is also equal to 10%, then the bond will be issued at par. So the issue price will also be 100. So on the balance sheet, what will we show? We will show a bond payable of 100 and cash increase of 100. If the coupon rate is 10% but the effective interest rate is 11% which means that investors are demanding a rate higher than 10% then this will be a discount bond which means that the issue price will be less than 100. If the coupon rate is 10% and the effective interest rate is 9%, 9% means that investors are actually willing to live at a rate less than 10% then the bond will be issued at a premium. You need to understand how to account for par value bonds, premium bonds and discount bonds. This slide illustrates the process for a discount bond and you need to be able to do the same for a par bond and a premium bond. So we have the same bond that we had on the previous slide. Investors require a return of 11%. So this is a discount bond. What are the interest payments, interest expense and reported value? So the calculations are done over here. 97.56 is how much it will be issued for. And how do you do this? You see all the cash flow discount back at 11%. The interest expense will be 11% which is the effective interest rate times the carrying amount at the start of the period. And then you make sure that you understand all the items and how they show up. I'll just finish the first row. Interest payment is 10, that's the amount 10% of par value. The discount, amortization of discount, that's the difference between interest expense of 10.73 and payment of 10. And the carrying amount at the end is 98.29 which is 97.56 plus 0.73. Eventually, as we follow this process, we will end up at 100. On the balance sheet, when the bond is issued, we show a bond payable of 97.56, which is the original amount, and an increase in cash of 97.56. On the cash flow statement, we will show a cash flow from financing, because a bond is a financing instrument, and this is an inflow of 97.56. Some miscellaneous points. When you talk about financial reporting, the effective interest rate does not change during the life of the bond. So throughout, if we started out with 11%, then we'll stay at that. This is very different from what we see in fixed income. In fixed income, we say that, look, the bond price varies based on the current market price. But with financial reporting, unless you are doing fair value reporting, you stick to the original effective interest rate which was there at issuance. The bond price rises for a discount bond so if this is par value of 100 and this is time on the x-axis the value of the bond initially will start at a discount but when it matures the price will be back to par. For a premium bond it goes the other way so starts at a premium and eventually comes down to par. There is this concept of a straight line method where rather than using a curve, you use a straight line to come down from the initial value to the final value. I don't think this is very important. Mostly we use the effective interest rate method. Moving now to leases. 
A lease can be classified as an operating or financial lease. A lease must be classified by a lessee. This is the entity that is using the asset and making the payments. As a finance or capital lease, these terms are used interchangeably. If any one of these four criteria are met, and these are US GAAP criteria, ownership transfer at the end, bargain purchase option whereby the lessee can buy the asset at a very low price, lease term of 75% or more of the useful life, present value of lease payments is 90% or more of the fair value of the leased asset. So effectively where it is a situation where most of the utility of the asset is being transferred to the lessee, then it should be treated like finance lease. I have picked the US GAAP concept here because this very clearly illustrates the point. IFRS says more or less the same thing but in very general terms. Now how do you report finance leases versus operating leases? Operating leases are very easy to report. On the balance sheet there is no entry. On the income statement the lease payment is simply shown as a rent expense and on the cash flow statement this will be shown as a cash flow from operations. What about reporting by lessee for a finance or capital lease? On the balance sheet at inception, the present value of future lease payments is recognized as an asset and as a liability. The asset is then depreciated and lease payments are amortized. On the income statement, the interest expense is equal to the lease liability at the start of the period times the interest rate. On the cash flow statement, the interest expense reduces CFO and the rest of the lease payments reduce CFF. Financial impact of lease accounting for the lessee. Now this is the table that I want you to read and figure out. The point is that if you have a company that uses a finance lease versus another that uses operating leases, obviously asset value will be higher for the finance lease and lower for the operating lease. Now that you understand the concept, you can fill out all these other items. Reporting by lessor. This now is the entity that has given the asset and is receiving cash. For an operating lease, the lessor will record revenue when earned. The lessor will report the leased asset on the balance sheet and the depreciation expense on the income statement. So the point is with an operating lease, the lessor keeps the asset on his balance sheet. Then if we have a finance lease or a capital lease, then there are two sub categories. You can have a sales type lease, which is the normal situation. Here the present value of the lease payments is greater than the carrying value of the leased asset. The asset is transferred to the balance sheet of the lessee. Essentially the lessor is selling the asset to the lessee and what happens is that the lessee is really making money in two ways then. One is based on the sale where the present value is higher than the carrying value of the leased asset. The other way that lessor is making money is based on the financing. So provides financing on the sale and reports profit on sale and reports interest revenue on lease receivable. Then we can have a direct finance lease and this term is only used in US GAAP where the present value of lease payments is equal to the carrying value of the leased asset. So lessor earns interest expense and at inception we simply record a lease receivable. Advantages of operating leases are fairly straightforward. So from a lessee perspective, less costly financing. Lessee typically pays less financing cost relative to purchasing on credit. Reduced less risk of obsolescence. Improves the leverage ratios compared to borrowing the funds to purchase the asset. And then in the US context, there might be a tax reporting advantage. From a lessor perspective, the lessor might have a tax advantage by keeping an asset on its balance sheet and possibly more efficient for lessor to maintain the asset. Pension and other post-employment benefits. Pensions and other post-employment benefits give rise to non-current liabilities reported by many companies. 
pension plans can be divided in two major categories defined contribution this is where a company contributes an agreed upon amount to the plan that amount is expensed every period so very straightforward the more complicated one from an accounting perspective is a defined benefit plan here a company makes promises of future benefits to be paid to employees the company can make a contribution to the pension fund or a plan asset so this is what companies actually do they need to meet an obligation in the future to meet the obligation in the future they create a fund today that fund is called the plan asset pension payments are made from this fund so the fund grows and then that fund is used to make the pension payments at any point in time the funded status of a pension plan is equal to the current value of the plan assets minus the defined benefit obligation which is the present value of the future obligation if this number is positive the then the plan is overfunded or we have a net pension asset if the number is negative then we are underfunded or have a net pension liability both ifrs and us gap say that you need to report the net funded status on the balance sheet so us gap and ifrs are quite similar here the net pension asset or liability is reported on the balance sheet under ifrs the change in net pension asset or liability has these three components the employee service cost net interest expense or remeasurements so the simple point is this that at any point in time there is a net pension asset or a net pension liability and during any period there is a pension cost now that pension cost has different components and at level 2 you will see this in a lot more detail where we understand that certain components go to the income statement and other components go to other comprehensive income and we touched on this briefly in the reading on the income statement and the balance sheet almost done with this reading evaluating solvency and we've actually seen these ratios before to evaluate the solvency of a company or a company's ability to pay off long term debt you look at the debt to assets ratio or the debt to capital ratio debt to equity ratio and financial leverage ratios if these ratios are high that means the financial risk is relatively high and then you have coverage ratios that we've seen before if the coverage ratio is high then that means that the company is relatively safe If you found this lecture helpful then I'll be very grateful if you can do three things for me. Number 1 like this video, number 2 like my Facebook page and number 3 visit analystforum.com and there add my logo to your studying with profile. You can see this slide for help on how to do that. Thank you very much and good luck with your studies.